Welcome to What a Creep, the show with Margot Donahue and Sonia Mansfield talking about creeps from the past to the present. This is your quick guide to the biggest creeps, jerks, assholes, and losers, the best of the worst. From two nice ladies who want the world to be a little less creepy. Welcome back to What a Creep. This is Margot Donahue, and my cohort in creepitude, as always, is the amazing Sonia Mansfield. Hey, Sonia. Hello, my friend. Hello, my friend. We have a baseball-themed episode today. Yay! Sonia is a huge baseball fan. We are doing this because on my other show, Book vs. Movie, we covered The Natural, and uh, spoiler, we hated it. And uh, we <laughs> You hated the book and the movie? Uh, the book is actually pretty good, but uh-huh. it's very different, but the movie is... They have Robert Redford playing a 19-year-old. He was 47. So, yeah. Like a 19-year-old yeah, with like liver anyone. spots on him. I, I just <laughs> couldn't even. Anyway. <laughs> so we are the podcast that talks about creeps from the past to the present. We have an old-timey baseball creepy tale for you today. But we're always looking for suggestions from y'all. So places to do it on social media. We have a basic Facebook page, but that's a place where people go to complain about our language. This is your warning. We will use salty language in this program. So earmuffs for the kids or, you know, something else. Yeah, shit. Fuck damn. We have a private Facebook group where you and I are the most interactive. You have to answer a couple of questions to come on in. And we just talk talk about creeps in the news. We talk about pop culture. Every once in a while, we show pictures of our pets. That's like one of my favorite things that we do. I love that. It's a nice group to hang out in. On social media, Twitter, it's Creep Pod because somebody had what a creep for 10 years and never used it. Creep. But on threads and Blue Sky and Instagram, it's what a creep podcast. And we have an old timey email, whatacreeppodcast at gmail.com. And if you would like some stickers, send us your address via email and we will drop them in the mail for you. They post here, right? And I will do it, y'all. Like, just dare me. She will. She will. I will walk right by that post office and drop it right in there. She she does. She's she is on it, y'all. I'm super on it. All right, Sonia, do you want to talk about the website real quick? Yeah, you can go to whatacreeppodcast.com and it's everything you wanted to know about the podcast, but we're afraid to ask. We have links to all of our past episodes and you can click the little title there and it opens up to a whole blog post with all of our sources because we source everything we do. We want to give credit to the journalists that did the hard work. So if you want to do a deeper dive on any of our creeps, that's a fabulous place to start. You can also go to our merch shop where we shall sell, shell, 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 sell, sell tote bags and t-shirts and notebooks and face masks and all the things with our logos. And somebody asked recently if we could get a ragey Sonia or ragey Margot would like a word shirt. So Ooh. I will try to, I will try to get on that one for y'all. I've got some time this weekend. There's a link to our Substack if you want to sign up for that, where I put out a monthly newsletter. And yeah, I know I forgot April, but I'll do May. You'll see. You'll see. And then we have a link to our Patreon. You want to tell them about that, Margo? Yes, P-A-T-R-A-O-N. It's another way you can help support the show. We have our first eight seasons up on that board. Eight. Yep, we're completing season 24 right now, though, by the way, Sonia. It's, it's episode 10, season 24. That's what? right. We've been here 24 years. It feels like it sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> We put out two bonus episodes a month, plus you have the access to those first eight seasons all for you. If money's tight, though, you know, we totally get that. We totally understand. If you could just leave us a review wherever you get your podcast, a positive one would be amazing. But, you know, Sonia, we have a couple of five-star reviews. Why don't you read yours right now? Yeah, I have one on Apple, and it is from I'm Feeling Sublime. She gave us five stars, said it was an excellent podcast. She loves the idea. I said she, it could be they. Yeah, I was just going to say they. They seem to really love the show. They gave us five stars. Someone named Becky, maybe we mentioned Becky last week, uh, also gave us five stars and said love. I have an international list here. So this is Branagh from Ireland. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Love these ladies calling out creeps I knew about and opening my eyes to new ones. Keep it up, sugar tits. I actually (laughs) have a shirt that says sugar tits on it and I wear it to sleep sometimes. So yeah, that cracked my ass up or, Good but you job. know, Spotify 
all those places. If you could just do that, yes. that'd be amazing. And as we were saying, we always end the show with someone who's not a creep. This is a baseball theme one. So we have a baseball history kind of creep thing going on. And then somebody who's not a creep. Are you ready to play ball? Is that how it goes? I've got my I've got my peanuts and cracker jacks. <laughs> do they do that in Chicago? Do what? They take me out to the ball game? Is that Oh, they, all of them. All the ball games you oh. sing uh take me out to the ball game at the seventh inning stretch. Oh. And everybody stands to stretch. Ugh, and you sing take me out to the ball game. And then when it's like and we root 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 for the and you scream your team's name. So it's like giants. And if they don't win, it's a shame. So it's a, yeah. Every we as lost far so as many I know, it, normally reach. <laughs> yeah, they're like peace out, nerd. Um, I I haven't been to like every ballpark, but the games I've been to, that is a thing in the seventh inning. Yes, because our creep today, what took place? Uh, his event took place in Chicago. So we've got three okay. big baseball cities: Philly, Boston, and Chicago, basically. Oh, and L.A. By the way. So, do you know who Eddie Wakeus is? I don't. All right. Well, he was a ball player in the 40s. And let me just start here. The Eddie Wakeish shooting is a notable event in baseball history. It occurred in 1949 when the popular first baseman and World War II hero. And that's what they did, by the way. As soon as the war started, everybody. He worked for the, at the time he was with the Philadelphia Phillies. And he was shot by an obsessed fan named Ruth Steinhagen. I keep saying Steinberg and then things don't turn out right. So it's Ruth Steinhagen. The incident, the incident was a shocking reminder of the dangers of celebrity obsession. Also, it inspired Bernard Malamud's novel, The Natural. Eddie Wakeus was known as The Natural, which was later adapted into a popular film starring Robert Redford, who played a 19-year-old when he was 47 at the time. I have to kind of <laughs> hammer that home, how ridiculous Look, it is. We understand. Some people think The Natural is the best baseball movie ever made. And they're wrong. I am not, I am not <laughs> one of those people. Um, but again, taste varies. Your mileage may vary. Your mileage may movie. vary. That's, that's the way to put it. Our trigger warnings for this episode, gun violence, stalking, alcoholism, and mental health treatments. My and sources. baseball puns. <laughs> and baseball. wicked baseball puns, y'all. NPR, Wikipedia, of course, the Chicago History Museum, History and Relics. It's a YouTube channel, Chicago PBS, and also a book that I really enjoyed called Baseball's The Natural, The Story of Eddie Wakeus by John Theodore. We always start at the beginning. Ed Edward Stephen Wakeus was born September 4th, 1919. He is from Massachusetts, Cambridge, Massachusetts. He grew up in a Lithuanian family. Um, his parents were immigrants, very hardworking. He could speak four languages. He was extremely intelligent and he played, you know, you hear about these athletes, they played, they lettered in all the sports. That was Eddie. He was great at everything. Mm -hmm. When he has, he has a, has a sister. When he was 16, his mother passed away and the family had always thought he would go to Harvard. His grades were so good and his parents were both working, but with the mother gone, he needed to help out his dad and his sister. So when he was 17, he graduated high school, and he just started working in the semi-pro circuit. Started in a place called Warumbo Woolen Mill. I'm sorry if I got that wrong. In mm -hmm. Lisbon Falls, Maine. And as a rookie, he was known as the natural. Because he was tall, and he had an incredible reach. Like, he, had, he could swing really well. His um, average was 300. He could swing really well, but also he had very long limbs, and he could reach really well. So he could play offense and defense. He could catch any ball. Hmm. And he usually liked to play uh, first base. Okay. And he's very cute. He could, could have gotten to first base with me. hey yo, <laughs> hey yo. <laughs> His Gonna slide into home. hey yo. Some notes here. So he, he was working in Maine, and then he gets picked up by the Angels in Los Angeles, and it's their minor league team. He's so handsome. He starts dating movie stars like as soon as he's out there. Yeah. So nothing's changed. Nothing's this is changed. Still a thing. <laughs> it's still a thing. But he's yeah. like Sonia Haney, and yeah. And then he gets picked up, and he's with the Chicago Cubs. Immediately is like he's rookie of the year. He they immediately put him on first base because he's so good at what he does, and also the guy is a total charmer. He. He treated everybody equally. He had a lot of self-confidence, but he also treated people with decency. He was great with women, and he could dance, 
and he was very funny. And he always hot. seemed to have, it's so fucking hot. Competency is so fucking hot, y'all. Just somebody who just knows what they're doing and just, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look him up Look right him up. Now. He's a cutie. While he's in the baseball, World War II breaks <laughs> out. <laughs> the baseball. <laughs> he signs up, like I said, like everybody that was old enough and, and, and active enough, you know, because we needed a, a large army right away. And so a lot of baseball players did that. And that's why they had the ladies league for going for a while. He yes. is sent overseas and he is in the Philippines and he exper- he's in the Navy, experiences kamikaze planes trying to come and get him. He, exper- he was temporarily kidnapped by the Japanese. He had a friend oh that was gosh. taken for two months. He survived landing on beaches and landing and seeing bodies everywhere you know like at the beginning Jeez. of uh what's the movie i'm thinking of? private Saving private, private ryan. ryan he one time was in a foxhole with a friend and another friend was shot and his leg had a, like a gash in it and he's laying out there and it's at night and it's super dark ed immediately jumps out of the foxhole goes and gets the guy he can't figure out how to close up the gash so he just takes the safety pins off his his suit his uh, his uniform and stitched it up and brought him into oh the gosh. foxhole. Damn. What a hero. He's such a hero. He's also, and he saved the guy's life. And he's the kind of person that he doesn't get freaked out with danger. He does, He has so much confidence and he's just calm. Mm-hmm. And he just does his shit. Now, this is the thing. It's got to go somewhere. <laughs> He's in a profession and he's being in the army. Every, you know, everything's always heightened and he's probably, he probably thrives under that. And then when you're playing baseball, you know, it's intense. The whole time you're out there, you have to perform. There's how many games a season? I mean, and he, you know, they play double headers and stuff like that. 161 games a season. That's a lot. It's a lot. it It is. So he comes home and he immediately joins again. He's back into the Phillies and he does really well. I'm sorry, back with uh, the Chicago Cubs. When he comes back, there's, there's the day that Babe Ruth in 1947, when he has like a tumor on his neck and he's giving this speech and he says, gotta go, you know, basically, because yeah. he's dying. A, a young lady named Ruth Steinhagen was in the crowd. And she's like 17 and she's very, very beautiful sitting in the crowd is listening to the babe's speech. They're playing it over the speakers. And so while it's playing, she's just sort of darting her eyes around. And then she notices this guy at first base and she's like, zoing. Like, yeah, I looked him up. He's, he's very, he's handsome. He is. And just that, just very confident. He knew how to talk to people. Yeah. He was like a peacemaker. You know, if people had arguments, he was, he did great with the ladies. Yeah. You know, I get it. There was this whole thing in baseball that teen girls, Bobby Soxers, got into baseball. There's cards. You know, all the guys are listening to the games and they're talking about the games. So the girls start paying mm-hmm. attention. Then you got some young athletes that are really cute. Yeah. And girls are like, ooh, who that? And so they would call them baseball Sadies. Sadies? My cat's name is Sadies. Sadies. There's baseball Annies and baseball Sadies. Like every... Ooh. And these Sadies are teen girls. They meet in clubs. They have their favorite players. They go to the... This is back when the games were affordable, by the way. Like people could just go to a game. Like it wasn't like it is now. And they'd find their favorite players. And the players were very accessible. They would come right out from the subway, you know, and walk through the parking lot to get there. You could see them coming in. You could see them going out. They were very friendly with fans. They were encouraged to be. And a lot of these guys were not, you would be surprised how little they were paid considering how much the owners made. And they right. were not paid during the off season. So sometimes, you know, it's just making connections with people. Yeah. You know, it takes you to the next yeah. level. What's a, ba- what's a baseball Annie? Is that? I think that's the more risque version. Interesting. Cause in Bull Durham, the lead character is named Annie. And I, she's I think that's what it baseball. is. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I did not know this. Yeah, baseball Sadies. The Sporting News actually wrote um, columns about this and said, watch out for these baseball Sadies because they're bolder and more sex conscious than normal women. Woo! (laughs) And female fans of the game were very indignant. Like, sure, we're here to look at hot guys, but also we like the game. Like, this is not... This is the thing, y'all. So the Giants went on a... Here in San Francisco, where I live, 
the San Francisco Giants went on a, a, they were on a streak. Like they won like three World Series in like six years or something. And everybody here got caught up in it, including me. There were all kinds of women at these games. And then like you wear the shirt or the jersey, you know, and then someone's like, can you name three players? And it's like, fuck off. Like, I don't have to audition for you. Right. To like baseball. But it was... And it was interesting that it became kind of a phenomenon that all of a sudden women were going to baseball games. And it's still like they are an untapped market of baseball and they like try a little bit to like appeal to the women, like kind of what they're doing with football now. Mm -hmm. They would get a female crowd for a while and then they would kind of lose them again, however, and then they get back into it and then they lose them again. And I think women are back into it currently. Sociologically speaking, I'm going to put my nerd hat on, but yeah, I love it. When more women are involved in a situation, it's less violent. The more dudes density of dudes, the more, the the more chance there is for violence versus having more evenly spread out with the genders. Yeah. But also, yeah, and baseball's a totally different vibe than other than sports. Football and hockey. It's, it's right. Yeah, it's slower. Very slow. It is. You know, I that's what I like about it. I could keep. I don't have to. The rules are easier to understand. Um, not that the other ones are like super hard. It's just not my jam. It's basically a game of math. It's statistics and math, and we're going to get into that in our next dorking out movie. But it's. I think it's one of the reasons that women are drawn to baseball is the atmosphere it's being outdoor it's outdoors right a lot of games are during the day it's a great way to spend the afternoon i mean there are just the traditions that it has and the music that they play and yeah Mm -hmm. you know like football is fun but it also is very tense you know hockey the same like fun but really like it changes on a dime basketball right baseball is more like okay i don't relax i wouldn't relax at a basketball or a football game i actually find baseball very relaxing that's a way of putting it yeah so annie annie excuse me ruth ann steinhagen (laughs) she was very tall she's like 510 brunette very attractive she had a lack of social skills she didn't have a lot of friends she didn't have a lot of interests Guys asked her out all the time and she would go out. You know, she liked to dance and stuff like that. She liked music, but she didn't know how to have conversations. She was just very Mm. intense. And as soon as Eddie got in her sights, like she became a super fan. And like I said, there were clubs that, you know, teens would meet and, you know, and then they'd go together and then they root for the guy that they're a fan of. And she just went like next level. She always went by herself and as, and she watched from a distance and there was a shooting once at a Chicago Cubs player named Billy Jurgis. His girlfriend shot him. This was in 1932. But for the most part, like I said, fans, it used to be fine. Like you could just be right near them. My dad talks about yeah. this when he was a kid in Brooklyn. But she was totally obsessed with him. She learned to speak Lithuanian because he could speak Lithuanian. Did he know who she was? She's clearly obsessed with him. Did She gets closer and closer to him. Okay. But she never really has contact with him. Okay. She just can't, like, as soon as she gets to Fliberty, the first time she saw him up close, like coming out of the dugout or whatever you call that thing. I'm just kidding. I know it's a dugout. But she <laughs> she fainted. Like, the so, like, he really, she, she had it bad for this guy. Okay. She started telling her family that she was setting a place for him at the dinner table because he was going to show up. He wasn't going to show up. Mm, I do that for Pedro Pascal. He never shows up. Maybe we, maybe you have to manifest it. <laughs> maybe that's what we do. Okay. His jersey number was 36. So, so she bought every record from the year 1936 that she could find. She had pictures Whoa. of him all over her room, on her bed, on the floor, she had news articles. She knew everything he did. She knew that because he was from Massachusetts, she ate baked beans every day because she oh thought that people from Massachusetts do. She had a job as a typist. And one day she, she thought that her boss looked too much like Wakeus. So she just like walked out of the office and quit. She had like one or two jobs in her life. She was just not 
that boss has got some nerve looking <laughs> like her obsession. Her parents were like getting really tired of this. Like she would just spend hours in her room just staring at photos. So they tried to take her That's to a psychiatrist. Creepy. It didn't take. Yeah. Then in uh, Christmas time, 1948, Eddie gets a uh, you know traded. And it's like the, the, the Cubs did a lot of really stupid things for a very long time before they finally won a World Series again, right? Because it was mm-hmm. all those years that Bill Murray would show up you know, to that game. Anyway, they traded him for like two pitchers or something like that to Philadelphia. Ruth Ann didn't handle it well. She cried for two days. Her parents basically said, you need to go to a psychiatrist. If you don't go to a psychiatrist, you need to move out because you're driving us nuts. That'll fix it. <laughs> That'll fix it. So she gets an apartment. And I don't know if she's working or not, or if they pay for the rent, but it's this little attic apartment on the top of a building. Like, and she's real tall. She has to like hunch over and she just has pictures of Eddie everywhere. Oh my gosh. And she's spiraling. And she's spiraling. Girl, she is not worth it. It's not worth it. Eddie, meanwhile, goes to Philadelphia and does great, you know, because he's an awesome player. And he makes friends. He likes the city of Philadelphia. He's having a great time. And what do you know? They're doing a whole series in Chicago. So he's playing against his old teammates. Mm. So that he goes up to, this is in June at this point. And and somewhere around May, she decided she was going to kill him. That was her solving the obsession. It's terrifying. I I can't even wrap my head around it. Like, I I always try to, you know, have some empathy or put myself in someone's shoes i this stuff i can't i'm like it makes no sense to me you can't make sense out of it you got to kind of remove the person from the situation before they harm themselves or somebody like it's just girl just just move to philadelphia and start eating (laughs) cheesesteaks every day it's just just it's fine just and then don't hurt anybody if you want to stare at pictures and eat cheesesteaks do that she just couldn't she just couldn't. That's, yeah. you know, that's just, that's who yeah. she was. If I can't have him, nobody can. Exactly. And that's what she's basically saying. And she thinks mm-hmm. that's going to cure her. And she's just disassociated at this point. She's just completely yeah. like, so she can't, she realizes that you can't get a gun unless you have a license for it or some, I, I think. So she goes to a pawn shop and she buys a rifle. And then June 14th comes around. Eddie plays. It's a double header. And Eddie does really well. Like his first time at bat, you know, he hits a ball thing and go, I'm, I'm just kidding. But <laughs> at the first time at bat, like he hits really, he does really well. And she's sitting in the crowd in a white babushka, which is just like white fabric, like dress. Okay. He, he hits the ball. He goes to first base and she just stands up very dramatically and then leaves the game. And she goes back to the hotel. And so mm-hmm. she got a hotel room in Chicago where the, where the guys were staying and she's hanging out and she gives $5 to the uh, porter, you know, the bellboy. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And said, I got a note for Eddie Wakis. Can you give this to him? And basically, this is the note she said. They're at the Edgewater Beach Hotel. Mr. Wakis, it's extremely important that I see you as soon as possible. We're not acquainted, but I have something of importance to speak to you about, and I think you will it will be to your advantage for me to explain it to you. She also tells him that she grew up on the same street as him as in Cambridge. And then she says, please come to my room. I won't take up too much of your time, I promise. So he's thinking she knows somebody who knows someone. You know what I mean? Like a family yeah, or yeah. a friend or something. Yeah. So he gets back to his hotel. It's like 11 o'clock at night. So he calls her room and says, what's up? What's, what are you talking about? And she says, oh, can you please come to my room? Can't we do this over the phone? No, you really need to come to my room. Can you wait like 30 minutes and come over? And he's like, okay. So he comes over and he just kind of walks into her room. Why, why would he be afraid? I mean, the truth is like, if the roles were reversed, a woman would be like, no, thank you. I'll meet you downstairs at the bar or whatever. Right. But like a, a man isn't going to think that a man is like, she, what's she going to do? Right. Shoot me. Like, but it's, he didn't know. He didn't know. So he walks in and she says, I've got a surprise for you. And she goes to the closet And she gets the shotgun. She's like, for two years, you've been bothering me. And then she shoots him. He slumps over. And all he could think to say is, baby, why'd you do that? And then she's sitting there. And she expected 
a raucous. Like she expected all of a sudden. Yeah. I don't know. Like, but it's like in the middle of the night, and yeah. I guess it didn't make that much noise. So then she's running around the hotel on her floor, knocking on doors, saying, I shot Eddie Wakus. I shot Eddie Wakus. And the people are like, I don't know. And she was mad because they didn't know who he was. So then she goes to the room and she calls the front desk and says, I think you need to bring the cops in an ambulance. I shot Eddie Wakus. And the cops. Nice of her to tell on herself, I guess. Which, but that's the only way. That's how he lived. Yeah. Because he would have died otherwise. And right. it, it hit his chest. It got in, it got it pierced his lung. It lodged into his spine. So the cops take him to the hospital. All right. So this is around three or four in the morning. All of a sudden, he's just laying there in this hospital. There's reporters outside. You know, flash bulbs. The cops brought her to the hospital through a back door to bring him to his bed so that he could identify her. This woman just shot this man a few hours before. That is really, really scary. It's terrifying. I'm like, he must have been like shitting the bed. Like, oh my God. Yes. And he just said like, why did you do it? And she just looked at him. She goes, I'm not sure. And the cops take her out. I can't even imagine what like somebody is inflicted. It's, it's, we've talked about this before. Like, these injuries are no fucking joke. No, like, they're painful. But also, like, yes. when you see a lineup, they have the lights. His life. Sh- th- yes. Yeah. Well, they have the lights fo- falling into, so they can't, th- at the suspects, you know, they don't have it towards the person who's pointing at them, right? So that they right. can't see who's who's pointing them out. That's the whole point. Yeah. To keep it safe. They're bringing this woman who've confessed to shooting him to his side when he's got a bullet still lodged in him and it's yeah. like in the middle of the night he doesn't have his lawyer there there's not like not anybody like looking out for him it's so that's i would be so scared i would be so scared so he gives an interview from the hotel bed and i'm reading an article from june 18th 1949 chicago tribune dateline saturday <laughs> june 18th and he said i went up to my room and called her because i thought it might be someone i knew she said it was very important. When I turned around, there she was with this rifle. She says, you're not going to bother me anymore before I could say anything else whammy. The baseball player said that he has a vague recollection of asking why she saw, shot him. She had the coldest looking face I ever saw. No expression at all. From what I've heard about other people who shoot other people, they're supposed to get a big kick out of it. And he doesn't, regret, doesn't recall ever getting a letter from her before, although I couldn't be sure. But we're ballplayers. We get a lot of letters from girls. Propped up in his bed, looking haggard but cheerful, Wake has told reporters, I still haven't gotten over the whole surprise. It's just like a bad dream. Yeah. Surprise. She must be crazy charging around with a rifle. It was safer in New Guinea, wasn't it? Like when he was in World War II, he said, I never yeah. got a cold. I come back two years later, three years later, and this woman can just... America! <laughs> But that's like just an example of just like how he copes is like he's pretty yeah. like, eh, well, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. So he's sent home, you know, he he sent uh, to Philadelphia and the doctors have to figure out whether or not they take the bullet out. What, what's going to happen with him? His season's over. And yeah. then when spring training, really? he didn't just, he didn't just, get he had grit. <laughs> and then like the next day he's up there. Yeah. And he had to, by the way, when she was put in front of a judge, he was in a wheelchair. She's standing like three feet from him. And the judge it's is so scary. It's terrifying. And the judge is saying, obviously, this woman is having some kind of psychotic break. They thought it was schizophrenia. So the, the judge sent her to, to a mental hospital. First, they have to like, they have to, you know, take the bullet out. And he has to like slowly get his lung capacity mm-hmm. back and stuff like that. By the time he's, he is ready to go for spring training, and they're like, look, take all the time you need. He says, no, 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 I want to be with my team. So he goes to Florida, and he's, he's training there, Clearwater, Florida. He, they put him through this physical you know, recuperating and rehabilitation that is brutal, and it's in the sun, and it's the heat and all that stuff. Yeah. And one day he's doing these exercises, and he sees a really cute chick. And he's like, hey, I'm Eddie Wakus. And she's like, oh, hi, I'm Carol. I'm from Albany, New York. I'm traveling with my family. They fall in love. 
Aww. and they start a and he's romance. Like, Do you have a weapon? On you? <laughs> Do you know karate? Not interested? Can yeah. <laughs> She told the cops, I was so excited, uh, talking about uh, Ruth again. She told the cops, I was so excited, I could not control myself. I dreamt about killing him. I, I was holding him in my arm saying, don't you see, all my dreams have come true. Like, she's totally giddy, which means she's just not doing great. So yeah. she sent to, the, to this mental hospital, and he's sent back to the big leagues, and he does well. He's doing great with the Phillies. His lifetime battering average is 285, 24 home runs, 373 runs batted in. Yeah, it's not bad. Not bad. Um, For a guy who like been through World War II and being shot on top of that. And he does this for a few more years, but he's starting to have problems sleeping at night. I wonder why. And he's starting to get worried. Less than three years after the incident happens... She is released from the mental hospital. They had done shock treatments on her and said that she was cured, basically. Mm. And they let her just go back to living in Chicago. And she moved in with her family. go wrong. But apparently, she lived a very quiet life. She didn't work. She didn't leave the house very much. Her parents had bought their home. She and her sister stayed there. You know, a couple spinsters living in the family home. She lived to be 83, she lived, a, she, she lived a very long life. Yeah. Eddie, on the other hand, was having problems sleeping. He was having problems dealing with the off season. He was having problems. He didn't have as much flexibility as he used to. His back was starting to really bother him where the mm-hmm. bullet was. He's having issues. And yeah. at that time, people didn't go to a psychiatrist, especially right. men, you know. Yeah. Also, sports in general, it takes a toll on your body. You're, you don't have... A long shelf life in that career. Right. You, you know, and it takes its toll. You, people are like, I don't know. I think people think baseball isn't as f- physically taxing as, say, football or something. And it's taxing. It's just different. It's a different kind of. Well, especially your stress. joints, your shoulder and your knees yeah. and, yeah, your back. It's, yeah. you know, depending on what you, position you're in. Yeah. He's, yeah, he wasn't a pitcher. But if you watch, like, the slow motion. Mm-hmm footage of people who throw fastballs it looks unnatural it's bananas yeah so he goes from the phillies and he's in the orioles and then he's kind of out of the biz and he literally just he hadn't gone to college and he had no idea what to do with his life he's really smart but he has kind of limited skill set he doesn't it put him in sales you know everybody loved him so they were trying to give him a job but he just couldn't get the hang of it and he was going from job to job and then they would have to move. He and his wife had a couple of kids and he starts drinking and he smokes cigarettes nonstop and he's just being more and more alone and more and more moody and more and more just like not integrated with the family. And unfortunately he and the wife split up. Oh, and he, that's not in the movie. It's not in the movie. And it's a bummer because yeah, when you see pictures of them, they're like, oh, they're so cute. They have like their whole lives ahead of them. And right. You know, but he didn't have those kind of skills. So Eddie, he worked um, at Ted Williams, had a baseball camp, and that was like his favorite job. Like he would do that every mm. summer. But he got sick very easily. He would smoke two or three packs of cigarettes a day. Damn. Couple- and he had a lung injury. And he had a lung that. injury. And all the drinking that he did on top of that. And unfortunately, he passed away at the age of 53 to cancer. Oh, that's young. Well, fuck cancer. Esophageal. 53 is young. Dang. Yeah. That sucks. So that's our story today. That's our... (laughs) (laughs) The real story behind The Natural. Good job, my friend. Thank you. I didn't know any of this stuff, so I've seen the movie, and now I know more. Yeah. Did he at least, did he hit a home run where he hits the lights and all no. the sparks fly? Damn it, Hollywood! <laughs> no, I knew I knew that that wasn't real. That's- he was he was a great ball player, and he was and they love. I mean, like I said, people loved him. He was easy with people. He yeah. talked. He was good with reporters. He was good with fans. He just didn't have any of those skills for like a job job, you know, yeah. and he just and 
he had all this PTSD from what he experienced in World War II on yes. top of being shot at, you know, in a hotel yes. room there. So he he dealt with a lot of shit. Yeah, it's going to kind of fuck with your head. It will. That sucks. Good job, my friend. Thanks, my friend. Do you want to hear about someone who's not a creep? Yes, please. Okay. Do you know who Hunter Pence is? No. Hunter Pence is a right field, was a right fielder and a designated hitter. He played for the Astros, played for the Phillies, played for the Rangers, and of course, he played for my beloved Giants. So he was playing for the Giants from 2012 to 2018, and then he came back in 2020 to like finish his career so he could retire as a Giant. Um, people around here know they gave him the nickname the Reverend because he was like Mr. Like Pep Talk before, like during the playoff. They won the World Series like two times while he was there. And he was the one who would give these like pep talks in the dugout or in the locker room that would like get people all motivated and excited and they'd jump up and down and start losing their shit. He was that guy. Um, he is someone who appears to be really good at everything, which is obnoxious, but he also seems like someone who's like, I, you never read a bad thing about him. He's delightful. Um, and when he retired from baseball, he started a, I'm finding it, a nonprofit. Here we go, called Healthy Planet. And it's an organization that he started with his wife, more on her in a little bit. And they do work in the community together. It's about like cleaning up the neighborhoods, like practice, practice like sustainable living, like talking about climate change, reducing the carbon footprint. It's like all these really good things. He uses his, he's, he's very famous here in San Francisco. Like everybody loves Hunter Pence. And he uses that to his advantage here. He, he hosts a lot of different events, like, you know, all these cleanup events. And then you get lunch afterwards and he's going to be there too. And he's done stuff where they're planting trees and cleaning up parks. And then um, there was another one where they, he's, and he goes to all of these, him and his wife, and they're like cleaning up the beach. And then they get a surf lesson and like they get in kayaks and they clean up the water from the kayaks and they like get to hang out with Heather, Hunter Pence and go to lunch and all this stuff. It's so delightful. Um, you should do his it. Wife, I should do it. I, I love him, Hunter Pence. I He used to play for the Phillies and I hated Hunter Pence because he was really good. <laughs> and like every time the Giants played him, I'm like, fuck Hunter Pence. Because <laughs> like he always got home runs. He was so good. And I was like, I hate him. And then he came to the Giants and I was like, now he's my favorite player. <laughs> so good. But um, his wife is uh, named uh, Alexa and she, Alex, sorry, Alexis. And she, they met when she worked for the gaming website IGN. And mm -hmm. he and he was really into he is still they're both in really into video games. And he was at the office nerds. promoting nerds. <laughs> nerds. They were he was in the office pro, uh, as part of a promotion for the baseball game, the show, which is insanely popular. And she was there and he met her and he really liked her. And like she gave him a business card and then he like called her to and he's like can you have dinner with me tonight? And she's like, no. And she didn't know who he was really. And he's like, well, it's just, I'm going to be gone for two weeks on the road. And I, I really want to go to dinner with you. And she's like, yeah, all right. So she like went to dinner with him and she's like, and it seemed like a good date and everything was fine. And then he came back and he's like texted her and he's like, do you want to get coffee? And she sent him a picture of like her coffee that's like already on her desk. Like, two, I already got coffee. Thanks, though. And like, and then she like told playing her it cool. Like, yeah. Well, she's like, I really wanted to get coffee with him, but I I already have a coffee. So what she's are you gonna do? Literal. And her <laughs> and, yeah, and her coworkers like, you throw the coffee in the trash, you dumb dumb. Yes, and you go get a coffee with him. Like, 
And by like, this is all happening. Like, like she said, then she, she also has like a YouTube channel called let's, let's get Lexi. And like, she plays video games and like, he's really into that too. So you could see like their relationship kind of playing out on YouTube. And I remember talk like talking with friends and just being like, they're, they're in love. Like, I was like, they're going to get married. Like all the, they are, they got married, he proposed in like Disney world and they're married. They're and Disney all this people stuff. too. They're Disney people. Holy shit. I have nothing He's... in common with these people. <laughs> I know. Like they just seem delightful. All the, like just so delightful. They're always doing like good causes here around San Francisco, not just their cleanup stuff, but like, you know, raising money for like good organizations. He's always out supporting all the local teams that's wearing so their jerseys and like going to their games and all that stuff. Um, you know, recently he was in um, San Francisco's Bayview neighborhood, like planting trees and cleaning up um, him and his wife. Also. So Hunter Pence is also like really into coffee, like really, really into coffee. I like coffee. Yeah. So he apparently he drinks like a pot of coffee every day and he's like a double espresso man and all this stuff. So him and his wife started a coffee company called pineapple labs and it's all like, you know, ethically sourced coffee with like, you know, mugs and notepads and things like that, that you can buy. But 100% of the profits go to nonprofit organizations. Um, and they do like all kinds of different like pop-up events around the city. So they'll like, set up outside giants giants ballpark and pour coffee for a couple of hours and then they take all that money and donate it oh, that's to local charities. So cool. Yeah. There's one called there's a local there's a nonprofit called Pitch In and it's about providing like baseball and softball equipment to kids whose families can't afford it. So that because the, like there's a lot of kids that want to play baseball or softball. Or musical instruments, and they can't yes, fucking afford and they it. They can't afford it yeah. because there's yeah. like you, you know, buying bats and gloves, and like they might provide you helmets or whatever, but like they can't afford that stuff. So like, this is one of those things that they raise money for. That like, he just seems like a like an awesome, decent. They sound person. like amazing people. Yeah, Our people, and, that, and they you know, live here in San Francisco. He grew up in Texas, like in his, I know his family's still in Texas, but he's like all in on the Bay area. Yeah. And, and I love that. And that's why he's kind of my favorite. And if I bought a Jersey, it would probably be a Hunter Pence Jersey. <laughs> What's his number? But, uh, number eight. Oh, that's a good number. Steve Young's number. Oh, uh, my favorite, but even, I mean, yeah. that's football, not baseball. So that's our non-creep is Hunter Pence. I love that. That's awesome. I was worried a second there because like you, you were saying everything in the past tense. I was like, oh, no, what happened? Oh, no, I just, no, no, no. <laughs> I just meant that he uh, doesn't play with the Giants anymore. But he shows up at Giants events like all the time. And he seems delightful. He's also a very hyper person. Also, he used to, li he lives in this Millennium Tower here in San Francisco that everyone's obsessed with because it's starting to lean. Oh, yeah. And, um, but he, to get to the ballpark, he would ride a scooter. He just had like a little, like, scooter that he would like ride from the tower to the, um, That's adorable. ballpark. And then he donated the scooter to like the San Francisco, like, make a wish organization for someone <laughs> some sick kid somebody, on a scooter <laughs> and then <laughs> Sorry. somebody broke somebody broke in and stole it <gasps> what yeah and it turned into this whole thing where the, it was like the whole city was like find that scooter <laughs> and they they eventually they did and like caught the people who did it and it was kind of a repeat of another thing when like he had another scooter before that and somebody stole it and then, like, all of San Francisco was like, find his, who would steal Hunter Pence's scooter? Like, everyone was losing their minds. It was hilarious. Do you remember when Joe DiMaggio lived in San Francisco? This is a long time ago. Yeah. When the big earthquake happened, and he was leaving his house, and he had all these garbage bags and, and duffel bags. And he just was, like, heading off, like, looking really nervous and squirrely. Turns out they were full of money. Like he didn't Ooh. trust banks very much. Like he was always worried about. He was noticed notoriously cheap, 
he was so like there's there's footage you could see of Joe DiMaggio kind of so like how funny yeah like oh it's an earthquake I better like me and my money better go someplace it's, like, <laughs> it's in a sack with a giant dollar bill I mean seriously on it, bill yes sign, like come on you like carrying that sack of money over his shoulder. I mean, there's so many crazies in San Francisco. I mean, there's so much like wet, but it was, yeah, like we have our, they have their local celebrities and then like everyone yeah. is like completely obsessed with them. Yes. Joe he's Montana. Also, he, yes. He's also a notoriously good tipper when he goes out to restaurants. That's there's the another giant, um, Timmy, Timmy, Timmy Lincic, Timmy, Timmy Lincecum, um, a pitcher for the giants. He still lives around here and he is also a notoriously good tipper. If you ever worked a service job in your life, that's a big deal to me. We forgot to talk about yeah. um, in a bonus up about Ellen DeGeneres, and oh, that, we skipped over her. Yeah, she had that whole yeah. self pitying article. You know, I'm yeah, yeah. hated now and blah blah. It's like, did you actually hear the comments? Like, just how awful you treat people who are in the service industries? Yeah, it's just like because that's to me the lowest. Like, yeah, you're just a rotten get human. Some pers- get some, yeah, get some perspective. Get some empathy and perspective. Yeah. You too, Jerry Seinfeld. All of you. Oh, we had things to say on that Patreon bonus app. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. All right. That's the episode this week. And if you like the sound of our voices, and by golly, why wouldn't you? We also right. co-host, a, uh, <laughs> co-host a podcast called Dorking Out, where we dork out about movies. Our current movie that we're dorking out is... Oh, we're looking at each other. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, why don't I remember what it was? I feel terrible right oh, now. I know. Oh, no. The talented Mr. Ripley. The talented Mr. Ripley. Thank it was you. funny. <laughs> Sticking with a baseball theme, we're going to be talking about Moneyball next. Yeah. No, you don't have to read the book. I've nope. done that already. Please spare yourselves. You're fine. It's dry. <laughs> It's mm. real, but the film is fantastic. So yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking forward to it. I, I love watching it. Um, as a Oakland A's fan, yep, the team that is soon to be leaving here. <sighs> it's going to be a fun rewatch, though. It's very, very entertaining from what I remember. Well, if you have ideas for creeps and especially non creeps, that's where we usually suffer sometimes coming up with inspiration. Reach out to us at all those places I mentioned at the top of the show via social media. And we love it when you use the Annie Potts gif. We got one from Ghostbusters or just think of something clever or yeah. just leave it on the Facebook page like a lot of people do in our Facebook group. Yeah. Or email it. Once again, our email is whatacreeppodcast at gmail.com. And Sonia, where can they find you? You can find me at thesoniashow.com and The Sonia Show on all your social media channel preferences, whatever those might be. Uh, but if you care about Facebook, just go to our private Facebook group because I don't really linger outside of that group. Uh, where can people find you, Margo? My site is Brooklyn Fit Chick, and that's what I am for Instagram and also threads. And then I'm at Brooklyn Margo for TikTok. And I sent you a funny TikTok thing, by the way, today. Oh, I know. I need it was to watch a drag it show this. doing Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, the finale. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm, I'm Brooklyn Margo on Twitter as well. Okay, everyone, we're gonna have a brand new creep next week for season 25. Woo! Woo! Thank you so much for listening. And remember, be kind, be safe. Don't be a creep. Be a creep. Thank you for listening to us talk about creeps. You can follow us at What a Creep Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But don't follow us too closely. You can email us your creepy stories at whatacreeppodcast at gmail.com. But please keep your dick pics to yourself. <laughs>